Hi, I'm Jim Pierbon. I'm an energy marketing consultant based in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, and I'm the Game Changers columnist at the Energy Collective at theenergycollective.com. And I'm joined today here at the Energy Storage Association's annual meeting in Washington with Mark McCracken, um, the CEO of CalMac uh, in New Jersey. And Mark is a 37-year veteran of the thermal energy storage business. I've been in the business 37 years and essentially in 35 of those we have been doing ice storage or energy storage where you make a lot of ice at night and then during the day you use that ice to air condition the building. What are the easiest analogies or metaphors for explaining thermal energy storage to an audience uh, that doesn't quite understand it yet? And maybe we're talking about utility commissioners, building owners, who knows? Sure. So. It took me a while to figure this explanation out, but uh, if you've ever thrown a party, which everybody has, you would never think it's a good idea to start making the ice cubes for the party when people start walking in the door, right? Uh, you'd never be able to keep up with it. And it turns out you need about one pound per person coming to a party. Um, to air condition that same person the next day, you need anywhere from 150 to 400 pounds equivalent cooling, we'll call it, of, of ice, okay? So if it's ludicrous in a home environment, for one pound, it's a couple hundred times more ludicrous uh, to wait and act like you didn't know people were coming in a building and then start buying the power when it's two or three times the price uh, when you could have gotten it the night before much cheaper and been prepared. Summarize for us um, how thermal energy storage has evolved um, you know, recently and you know, lead us up to uh, the California energy storage mandate, um, which uh, became live last year, okay. if I've got my facts straight. Well, so the, the poor use of electricity with this practice of air conditioning has taken the electric grid from the early 60s. We had what's called load factors. That's kind of like a utilization. We were up around 70% on you know, 365. We used a lot of power on a, on a pretty good basis. But because air conditioning is very much during the day and not much at night, utility load factors have dropped dramatically. And so that has driven the price up uh, and we are not taking advantage of storage capability. So the ability to store energy, whether it's in batteries or thermally at the building, uh, is a very important aspect. And by ignoring it, we've created a problem and finally now, energy storage is, is going to be looked to to solve the problems that we are getting with, with, with renewables. Okay, I'm particularly interested in uh, lead designed buildings. Um, how can thermal energy storage uh, play a role in that? Well, actually in uh, 2011, I was the chairman of the board of uh, U.S. Green Building Council uh, and have been involved with it for a very long time. So it's a terrific organization uh, that's moving things in a very positive direction. Um, LEED uses ASHRAE 90.1 uh, for new construction, and that's based on energy cost reduction, for, and there's good reasons for that. And so, since off-peak power is dramatically less at night, you can reduce the cost of, of cooling your building, and so you can get LEED points associated with that. With LEED for new buildings, uh, for, excuse me, for existing buildings, so with LEED for existing buildings, they have what's called a demand response credit, where if you can take 10% off your load upon a call, either automated or manual, or if you've done something to permanently reduce the load in the building, you can get, you can get points. So it's very pretty well integrated with, with LEED. And that was going to be my next question about existing buildings. Um, where do utility commissions generally stand in their grasp of the potential for thermal energy storage. And I realize there are 50 states and the District of Columbia, and each one, no doubt, is very different. But if there's a way that you can characterize them, where, what the state of play is at the state level. Okay, so when you look at energy storage in general, uh, you have to kind of liken it to fossil fuels. When you pump uh, fossil fuels out of the ground, that, you're not just getting energy. You're getting a form of stored energy. And so when we try to replace those with renewables, which are forms of pure energy, if you've got energy storage and you're trying to replace with energy, you can't forget the storage aspect. So this move towards reducing carbon is gonna be a huge push to add storage, and it'll be on both sides of the electric grid. So when we do that, uh, the, the regulators are now looking to have uh, batteries or ways to store energy on the grid side 
I've focused uh, all my career on the demand side of the building, which buildings use a lot of power during the day and not much at night. So by very simply making ice at night, just like you would the ice for your party, you make the ice at night and you are ready to cool the building the next day. Uh, it's a very easy way to shift major amounts of electron usage to nighttime in, instead of during the day. As far as uh, regulation, California has put in a, uh, has made a huge step uh, to mandate a certain amount of storage that's based upon uh, an earlier mandate of increasing renewables. So when you add a lot of renewables to the grid, like for instance, wind mainly blows at nighttime, and we have so much other sources of energy that you can't turn down, like nuclear, that this is creating issues for what to do with this wind that's blowing at night. So since California put in a lot of that, and they put in a lot of PV, they are feeling the effects of not having essentially any storage on the grid. So they're creating a, a, a regulatory path to say, hey, we need storage and it's going to help integrate this into a feasible working dispatchable system. Okay. Building on the ice cubes for the summer backyard barbecue, uh, give us maybe three or four examples, practical examples, um, where thermal energy storage can begin making an impact. You know, we talk about ice rinks sure. and, and others. Oh, well, uh, essentially in the last five years, uh, six, six, seven years, we put in a dozen major projects in New York City uh, the uh, Bank of America Tower at One Bryant Park, it's the second tallest building in, uh, in New York. You've got Goldman Sachs World Headquarters right down next to Ground Zero. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, we put in uh, close to a dozen retrofit installations for Rockefeller Center, so the Rockettes are now uh, cooled by uh, ice. The Rockettes are cooled by ice. <laughs> exactly. <That's cool. laughs> um, you know, TIA, CREF, you know, major property owners. Uh, we've done lots and lots of projects. Uh, and it's simply, and it's, for them, it's a financial deal right now. It's, it's absolutely a financial deal. It's 70% less for your power at night. And if there's one thing people need to know, that commercial power is very different from residential power. Residential power, you're, you're charged for how many kilowatt hours you use. Commercially, you're charged for how many kilowatt hours you use, but you're also charged for demand charge. And that demand charge basically increases your daytime cost by a factor of two or three. So it's very important to shift to nighttime power as much as you can, because it's extremely inexpensive. I mean, one of the examples is, when would you buy gasoline? When it was, uh, you know, 99 cents or $3 a gallon? If it was 99 cents at night, of course you'd do that. That's the reality for commercial buildings every single day, and yet they, they really don't take advantage of it. All right, I got to ask you about uh, the duck curve. Yep. Um, if you were explaining the duck curve to uh, an unenlightened audience, how would you try to explain it in 90 seconds or less? <laughs> okay, well let's first uh, explain that uh, because of buildings and mainly because of air conditioning buildings, we're using a lot of power during the day and not much at night. With the advent of a lot of solar, the more and more solar that we start adding, which is giving us that energy, we're collecting that energy and not storing it in the very the middle of the day. So we get the most at noon. And so that is depressing the peaks during the middle of the day and actually pushing them out further. So if you look at the shape, uh, the head of the duck, you know, the shape of the profile of a duck, the head of the duck now is probably more four and five o'clock. It's pushing to later hours, okay? And so we have to be able to ramp up the production of electricity in a very steep curve. Now we do that now, but it's probably going to be getting more extreme as we go forward. So being able to prepare for that and store that energy ahead of time, we'll be able to uh, deal with the duck. Mark McCracken, thanks very much. Of CalMac in New Jersey, appreciate Thank it very you. much. Thank you very have much. a good rest of the conference.